Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you have enjoyed your networking coffee break. In this morning first session, the IMO 2020 Global Sulfur Cap was mentioned quite often. We also know that IMO has an even more ambitious goal uh, to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2050. To speak further on this very important issue, I'm honored to introduce our next distinguished speaker, representing MRIT, Japan's Ministry of Land Infrastructure and Transport. He is also the chair of IMO Marine Environment Protection Committee. There is no one better to provide us with a thorough briefing about IMO's ambitious goals for GHG reduction. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the stage Mr. Hideaki Saito. The floor is yours. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to join this important uh, seminar or symposium, whichever is concerned. Um, yes, as introduced, my name is Hideaki Saito. Um, at currently, I worked for the um, Ministry of Land Infrastructure, Transport, and Tourism, EMLIT. Uh, but uh, um, at this moment, um, I am a chair of the Marine Environment Protection Committee of the IMO since 2018. In this capacity, I have engaged a number of environment matters, greenhouse gas emissions, SOX, NOx emissions, as well as ballast water management, etc., at the committee. Today, I will introduce you um, not only greenhouse gas matters, but also many important environment issues which are currently discussed at the MEPC. First, um, this seat illustrates the background information of the IMO, namely International Maritime Organization, one of the UN specialized agencies which is responsible for safety and security, as well as securing marine maritime environment. You know, IMO has a long history of more than six decades, nearly 70, and it's located in London in front of um, the um, UK Parliament. The IMO is an intergovernmental body and gathers more than 170 states. In addition to these national governments, non-government bodies like ICS, Intertanko, many others, which are entitled to participate in the meetings. Uh, this is a di diagram which illustrates meeting bodies at the IMO. We have uh, various uh, bodies. Legal or regulation texts are in principle drafted and adapted at the committee level, and the MEPC is responsible for marine environment matters. The committee is to be held three times in two years, namely in every eight months we should have a meeting in London. It's good for me. Uh, on the most left-handed side here, you can see the term assembly. Uh, the assembly is the most supreme body of the IMO. Normally, a number of ministers or vice ministers join from their capitals. It is to be held every two years, and this year is the assembly year. We will have an assembly meeting in late November this year. Um, this is a snapshot of MEPC. Left picture, this one shows the overall scenery of plenary room, the largest meeting room at the IMO headquarters, and it suits for approximately 800 participants. The chair and the secretariat should sit on podium in front of every country and NGOs. And I normally should sit in the very center of the podium, so I see a lot of friends who join today. Um, as noted again, uh, many agenda items we should consider not only greenhouse gas, but also SOX, NOx, ballast water, 
currently we have started a discussion on marine plastic litter as well. Um, I will give you more details on each issue from now on. But uh, of course, the first issue is the greenhouse gas issues, namely GHG strategy. With regard to this item, at its 72nd session of the committee, the IMO achieved the landmark agreement, namely the adoption of GHG emission strategy for reduction from ships. This is the first ever global commitment for GHG emission reductions by one specific industry sector without differentiation among the countries. In this context, I'd like to stress that the IMO GHG strategy is based on the concept of non-differentiation of the countries. This is the most important difference compared to the concept which is enshrined within the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, more in particular CBDR principle, common but differentiated responsibilities. This means that while the rule by the IMO is universally applied to each vessel equally irrespective of flags, UNFCCC concept applies to countries on a case-by-case -case basis. You see, the IMO should treat every country in a fair manner. This is the most important thing we should keep our in mind. Now, I'm touching upon three types of emission targets which I agree that I am more. First, this one. The short-term target is set for the year 2030, namely international shipping as a whole should improve energy efficiency by 40% compared to its level in 2008. Uh, second, uh, emission target is the absolute emission reduction of 50% in between 2008 through 2050. This target is considered as an am ambitious, as introduced by our organizer, since in order to do so, this level cannot be done by conventional technology developments only, such as improvement of hard design, but the whole shipping industries should turn our minds to introduce very brand new technologies, including alternative fuels such as hydrogen. Moreover, it seems that zero emission vessels should start operation well before 2050 by this year. I think this would be considered uh, at the panel later today. Third, the strategy also decides the long-term goal, this one. The shipping industry should phase out GHG emissions entirely within in this century. This is also another uh, very ambitious one. Uh, not only setting the targets, three targets, uh, the strategy also contains several, not several, many candidate measures in, a, in three categories, short-term, mid-term, and long-term. Uh, you can see some example for, as for short-terms, uh, we have put uh, design improvements, operational improvements, and national action plan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is an issue which uh, currently the MEPC has dealt with. Um, following the adoption of IMO GHG strategy, MEPC at its 73rd session approved the roadmap to follow up actions with regard to the strategy. This seat contains all of the follow up actions towards 20, oh, sorry, 2023. Um, we are present here uh, towards 2020. Uh, the third range row is related to fourth GHG study, um, which is to be released in the end of 2020, so that at this year, in this year, you can have the very latest information with regard to, to further extent or to further amount uh, the international shipping emits uh, carbon dioxide. Um, you also are aware that on EEDI, the shipping industry is on phase one at this juncture, but uh, uh, phase two 
will start in the beginning of 2020, so that in this way, uh, EEDI becomes more stringent towards uh, 2022 or 23 or 25. At this moment, um, the correspondence group considers how and when we can start a phase two, if possible. And at this, on, on this matter, the correspondence group starts a discussion, and the correspondence group is led by the Japanese government. Now, with regard to the short-term measure, um, this seat contains the candidate short-term measures which are proposed to the IMO by various countries, not only countries, but also many uh, organizations you can see. Um, these measures, in total, more than 20, are to be considered in de detail in the working group meeting, which is scheduled in November and then in March, and hopefully the next MEP 75 can agree on a specific short-term measures, if possible, and then we can start the drafting work to meet the deadline of 2023. Uh, in this way, I hope that the IMO can make a timely progress on the GHG discussion with the aim of contributing to combating climate change. Um, the IMO also deals with another important um, environment matters. Uh, of course, this is an issue with related to IMO 2020 global sulfur cap. Um, I'm sure that all you know were on the matter from the 1st January next year, the sulfur cap becomes strengthened to 0.5%. This stringent regulation will be applied to all ships, not only new ships, but also existing ships. And also, you may be aware that not only the usage, but the carriage ban of non-compliant fuel oil will start from 1st March next year onwards. In order to make sure the compliance, the committee developed, approved, and adapt various guidance and guidelines as illustrated right in here. And also, um, I would like to note to deal with possible concerns on exhaust gas cleaning system, EGCS or SCLABA, in particular open loop SCLABA, the MEPC and its subcommittee on PPR, Pollution Prevention Response, will start on the discussion on the environment impacts of EGCS liquid effluents. Uh, you know, uh, many regional regulations have started to uh, prohibit the usage of open loop scrubbers, although um, I should say Japanese government allows to use that. I think this issue should be sorted out by the IMO. Um, not only on this matter, but also uh, with regard to the IMO 2020, the IMO issued a publication that contains Q&As on the matter at its website. And last week, um, the IMO held an international symposium on IMO 2020 and alternative fuels at the IMO headquarters. I heard that this was very successful. And uh, in addition to these two important matters, um, IMO has dealt with the ballast water management um, namely Ballast Water Management Convention, which was entered in force in September 2017. One important requirement is for not only new builds, but also existing ships to install ballast water management systems. This requirement for existing ships started in September this year, and all the existing ships shall finish installation of the systems by early September 2024. I think this would be another challenge to our shipping industries. And um, not only to these three matters, um, the MEPC also deals with anti-fouling systems, AFS convention. Um, this, shift, this shift describes the recent developments with this matter. Uh, beginning of this year, at its sixth session, the PPR subcommittee received a proposal from European countries to prohibit the application and the application of anti-fouling system um, containing cybertrine. Although Japan raised its concern on existing ships, 
this proposal was in principle approved by the PPR subcommittee and, forward, and was forwarded to for consideration to MEP 74 last May. At the last MEPC meeting, we had a lengthy and intensified discussions among the participants, but no one decided the decision was made. According, accordingly, this matter should be once again considered at PPR 7 early next year. I think this would become another uh, challenge to shipping industry because you see, once you paint uh, cyber, uh, cyber trains, uh, it, it would be very difficult to withdraw from, um, from, from the existing ships. Um, the other important topic currently discussed at MEPC is marine plastic litter. And this seat indicates how this issue has been considered at the MEPC. Uh, two sessions ago, uh, namely MEPC 73 adapted the action plan by 2025, and the main aspects are contained in the middle of this seat, as you can see here. Um, following the adoption of this action plan, the last session has developed a draft strategy with specific timelines, and this strategy was forwarded to the correspondence groups for finalization, and this would become a, an agenda item of MEPC 75 for, for, for approval. Um, with these, uh, the other issue is underwater noise. Um, underwater noise, once again, uh, comes on the agenda of MEPC. As five years ago, at 66th session, we approved non-mandatory guidelines on reducing underwater noise. But you may know, at the same time, the committee noted there were still um, significant knowledge gaps on this matter, and therefore, more research activities were needed. However, at the last session, the MEPC received the Canada suggestion to submit a new work output proposal for discussion at the next session. Accordingly, we will once again discuss and deal with this important matter. You see, uh, nobody knows how it goes, but uh, it, it's likely that we should discuss whether this issue should be um, regulated on a, on a, on a, by, by a legal text or, or not. This is an important issue. And the last one I should introduce to you is the Hong Kong Convention. Um, my personal note, um, when I was a head of the Japanese delegation, I was a drafter partly on this uh, important Hong Kong Convention, but unfortunately, uh, the entry into force condi condition has not been met. Uh, I believe that this is an important treaty, uh, not only from the viewpoint of the environment, but also for, for uh, sustainable development of the shipping industry. As you see, um, this treaty or convention allows to um, prevent um, marine pollution, but also allows the smooth withdrawal of aged or substandard ships from operations. Therefore, we, the committee, would like to encourage those member states who did not ratify the convention to do so at their earliest opportunity. And I understand that the many industry associations also encourage uh, to those who have not ratified the convention to do so. And I hope that the uh, BIMO and the industry association should uh, keep together uh, to uh, get, them all, get them on board. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this concludes my presentation. And as noted, um, of course, uh, the first priority of the committee is um, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, but also the IMO and MEPC has dealt with a number of environment matters, and I believe that this cannot be done by uh, the committee itself, and your cooperation would be very required. And in this way, I hope that we can um, achieve um, the environment protection and, and the sustainable development of the industry. Thank you very much.